Bo and Luke Nation, hope everyone's staying healthy out there. Uh, here we may or may not have a vaccine coming up, but who knows? Either way, we're here. I'm here. I'm your co-host, Luke Kerrigan. And I'm your other co-host, Bo Brabo. And this episode, ladies and gentlemen, we have one uh, outstanding United States Army Reserve Lieutenant Colonel Lisa Jaster. Lisa is... She's the first female U.S. Army Reserve uh, Ranger. She is an Army Ranger. I want you to let that sit in for just a moment. She is a badass, uh, I mean, an incredible badass Army Ranger. And hey, when you're listening in, we had some technical difficulties on some of the audio, so it's a little scratchy. Um, but if you listen in, uh, stick with it. She has some amazing things to say. She will really help you get after it. Um, and hey, hey, you know, Luke, if, if they have complaints about the audio, don't you think they should really keep those to themselves? Yeah, Lisa will find them, hunt them down in their sleep and beat them down. I mean, she's one of the first females to ever graduate Army Ranger School. She's hardcore. Yeah. Oh, she's super hardcore. Watch her on Instagram, man. She's deadlifting like a thousand pounds. Um, and Lisa's husband's a Marine. She'll talk about him. So imagine that, a Marine and an Army Ranger in the same house. You, you would never know they're coming. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. God help the person that tries to break into that house. Yeah, they're done. <laughs> but it's, it's awesome because we know we have people like Lisa uh, defending our country and standing up for our, our, our way of life and our values. And that's just awesome. And we are so incredibly honored to have her on the show so we don't want to we don't want to hold this episode back any longer. So just bear with it. You can hear it. You can listen, and be sure to check us out on thebowenlukeshow.com. You can you can leave feedback, but not negative feedback about Lisa, and you can check out other episodes. The YouTube link, the Apple Podcast link, it's all there for you. If you want to be a guest on the show, be sure to hit us up, and also you can subscribe to our new email list. And we're going to start putting out information to you uh, via email so you never miss a beat. That was beautiful. Let's do this. You ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Why don't you just start us out and tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, I'm really boring. No, a um, little bit about myself. So... Uh, obviously right now I am the director of civil engineering. I guess I shouldn't say, obviously I'm the director of civil engineering for an engineering firm out of New Braunfels, Texas. It's called m &S engineering. Uh, it's a new job that happened after what I am currently referring to as my, my midlife crisis, where I shell after 12 years of being there on kind of a, uh, I don't know one one of those events that happens in life that ultimately changes the course for in my case, definitely for the better. Um, that's my day job. That's Monday through Friday. And then every night lately and on the weekends, I am the battalion commander for 980th Engineer Battalion as an Army Reserve Officer, engineer specifically. Um, I am the first female reserve officer to, or first female reservist and first mom to graduate from Army Ranger School, which... Um, if any of your listeners don't know what that is, it's, um, in my humble opinion, the Army's premier leadership school. Uh, it actually includes students from all over the world, as well as all the different service branches. So it was pretty exciting to be part of that initial group of women that went, that uh, tried, got accepted, and then ultimately three of us from the initial group graduated um, maintaining slightly longer than the other two women. So officially, I am not first female graduate but I'm in that first small cluster in that first group yeah yes yes That's awesome. uh, I definitely don't want to take credit where credit isn't due I wasn't the first female but I was in that first cluster um but more important than all of that I am a military spouse so I have a marine corps reservist husband who's in um the marine equivalent to a brigade command he's he's got a CAG unit out of California right now um, and he owns his own financial advising firm. And then I have two amazing children, uh, an 11 year old boy and an eight year old girl. Wow. Life is full. 
Very. Lots of hats. Yeah. Lots of hats for sure. So, so why don't we just get right at it? Um, what does it take or what did it take uh, for you to, for you to get through? And, and I'm sure you have numerous examples uh, while you were going through ranger school. Um, but what led you to the point where you said, I want to be that person. I want to go for this. Uh, and, and ultimately making the decision in your mind that I can do this. Right. It's, it, it could not have been an easy, easy decision or easy choice. Um, and, and, you know, when you get into those tough scenarios, I know, you know, a lot of people tend to, to give up and, and quit. Um, it's like the Navy SEALs ring the bell, you know, they just, they just have had enough and they don't make it. So there's something in the people that do make it that I think our listeners could really benefit from hearing that directly from someone like yourself. Yeah. The decision to go is actually a pretty convoluted story to say the least. Um, I had my senior enlisted advisor, my uh, sergeant major of my unit, write me an email and say, Hey, Lisa, this is our Hey, Major Jaster, this is something you should look at trying. The, the Army is going to open this up to women. You like to shoot. You like to rock. You like your physical fitness matters to you. You're a tactician. You enjoy reading about the military, studying the military. This is right up your alley. And my response to him was not only no, but I like room service. That was, yeah. that was oh, my 20s, not my I'm about I'm almost 40. You know, at that time, I was 37 years old. I turned 38 uh, two weeks after graduation. So, you know, yeah, at at almost 40, the last thing I want to do is go without a shower for 10 days with a bunch of, the average age is 22. So a bunch of 20-year-old males, of course. That's not how I I envisioned spending my summer in 2015. So um, a guy by the name of Robbie Payne, and he... um, he talked to my husband and, and the two of them kind of ganged up on me to, to say oh, wow. the least. And yeah. So, so my husband, um, in military tactical terms, kind of performed a flank maneuver. Um, we're, we're slightly traditional and I cook dinner and we all, we all try to sit down for dinner every night and we're sitting down for dinner with the kids. And my, uh, my husband brings this topic up and Hey, you know, item one, you need to pass, check, item two, check. And he goes through this kind of checklist of um, things you have to be capable of to graduate from Army Ranger School. And I'm like, yeah, I could do it, but you've got young people. Like, mm-hmm. I don't need to make a name for myself. Um, I'm really happy in my life. Uh, this is one of those things you do when you're still establishing yourself, um, really trying to reach, reach for the stars. And I was kind of, I was kind of past a lot of that. Mm-hmm. So uh, he had an interesting point. He always has a lot of interesting points. But um, at the time in my signature block, there was an Einstein quote that says uh, a ship is safest at the shore. but That's not what it's built for. Right. And, and Alan, my husband, really looked at me and said, you were built for this. And, and what happens if if you don't try and and nobody passes? Yeah. Like, what you're gonna feel when you're sitting on the sidelines easily at the dinner table with your two kids went through the checklist and said, yep, I can do the road march. Yep. I can do this. Yep. I know tactics. Yes. I know people I've been in the military off and on since 1996. So yeah, I know, I know the leadership game. So you sit through there and you go through the checklist and you're like, yeah, I could do it, but I don't want to. And then what if no one else passes? And then the combat exclusion law that was overturned later in 2015 doesn't get overturned. And all the things that have happened since then yeah. for, um, I'm going to call it gender opportunity instead of gender equality. Because for me, it's always been, um, it's not about forcing people to go through a door. It's not about saying, hey, we need 20% women or the American population is X percentage of women and X percentage of males and our military should resemble that. For me, it's always been, hey, there's a couple of people out there in this world that are like me that prefer not to have painted nails or like being dirty or don't mind being in the field for an extended period of time or like hunting and fishing. So instead of those of us, the small group being told, no, let's say, hey, you have the opportunity, but not force anybody to do it. 
So, um, oh, to make a short story very long, yeah. uh, that's kind of how I got myself. I affectionately say suckered into ranger school. Yeah. Um, but then once I got there, you know, all of that changed. You know, at first it's, it's hey, um, what if what if you don't do it and nobody can complete it? And then it changed a lot for me because it stopped being this, hey, I'm going to do this for the women. I'm going to do this for the army. I'm going to do this for my kids. And it, it got down to something very, very simple, which was every day I woke up and I had a conversation with you know, that let's call this generic ranger student, 22 years old, young, um, maybe a young enlisted man, maybe somebody who had just graduated from college and they're a young lieutenant. And I'm sitting across from these people. I'm, I'm sharing meals with them and they're asking me these crazy questions. And I realized that they had never met a Lisa Jaster before. Yeah. And what I mean when I say that is, when they look at women and look at women in the military, they think of ooh, my mom, my sister, my wife, my, you know, my cousin, whatever woman that they've had in their life before, that's who they were comparing opening combat arms to. Ooh, yeah. I would never want to see my mom on the front line. But then they see somebody like me and I'm talking about um, bow hunting with my husband or, um, you know, Hey, I'm really good at land navigation. I'm really good at land navigation because I like to be outdoors. I like hunting. I like camping. I like fishing. I like these things. And suddenly these young people who might have 20 years left in the army and might lead hundreds and even thousands of soldiers during their time in the military met somebody who didn't fit the mold that they had made. So whether or not I had graduated, it had gone from this grandiose, I want to change the opportunities in the military for women to, Hey, maybe somewhere in this room is the future secretary of the army or the future um, commandant of a training school. And right. he is now going to look at each individual for what they're bringing to the table rather than saying, Oh, well, all the girls go over here and all the boys go over there. Right. Yeah. That's a phenomenal right. outlook. It's so true, right? Cause your impact, your impact in the moment is that room so you're sitting in a room, you're sitting in a room and you're seeing all these young, these younger soldiers. Uh, and it just starts coming to your mind that the impact that you could have on them individually uh, could be profound. You know, it's the, it's the big world of, of you being a first in this environment to really coming right down to a very small group of just the people in your course, in your class, your fellow classmates, uh, which, which seems like it would make it very real, right? And, and I think the inverse of that was the scariest part is what if I, what if I come off as a cranky old lady or yeah. <laughs> or growing up when I was really early in the military, women got to be three types of women and none of them were complimentary. And uh, yeah. that's rolling around in the back of my head as somebody who went to West Point, which amazing school I was, I was treated really well. So I'm mm -hmm. one of those success stories. I don't have any, I don't have any stories of horrible sexual harassment or any of those. I don't have any of that baggage. So I'm really, I have a great viewpoint, but I was, my class was 10% women, give or take. So uh -huh. we're always in the minority. So you still kind of had some of those jokes or listened to some of those jokes. And I just didn't want to make those jokes the reality. And, and yeah. so being influential and motivating and positive was also combined with the anxiety of being the girl that proved everybody right. Yeah. Were you like that growing up? Like, did you play sports in high school or anything like that? I mean, around the boys in high school, was that your character growing up or did you find that more like when you finally got into West Point and now you're in this military environment? Um, yeah. What would you say about that? That's a really funny question. Um, <laughs> I have always thought of myself as somebody who's a little bit more of a tomboy. That uh -huh. being said, if you looked at my youth resume, um, when I played U8 soccer, there was two girls on the soccer team. It was all boys. Mm -hmm. But I grew up, and when I grew up, I got in a little bit of trouble uh, in middle school. And it kind of held over in high school. I was a bit of a troublemaker. Yeah. But I danced. 
So I <laughs> yeah. guess, um, ballet, tap, jazz, interpretive, character. Uh, I was in musicals. I was in choir. And although I played soccer, I was also the cheerleading captain. So yeah. to say I was one of the guys, is, eh, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, but when I went to West Point, one of the things I thought of, and I had wanted to go to West Point for a long time. So when I actually got into the academy, I, I thought about, oh, I could be on the cheerleading squad or I could do this extracurricular activity. And I, I forced myself to say, well, why, why did I go to West Point versus the University of Wisconsin, which uh -huh. is where I grew, up. I grew up in Wisconsin? So why am I not going to a UW school? I'm going to a military academy because I want to be in the army. So I joined the martial arts team and I tried to stay really involved in more of the combat sports and the team sports because specifically I thought, hey, this is what's going to help me in the long run, mm -hmm. which again ended up being very amusing because by the time I became a senior at West Point, a firstie, um, I ended up being part of the rabble rousers, the cheerleaders as one of the school's mascots. So gotcha. Um, I guess I, I tried to combine my roots of cheerleading and dance with trying to be um, a tough girl as well. Yeah. No, that's pretty cool. That's a good story. Yeah, I asked that because I'm a father of two daughters and they're both ad adults. And the oldest one is a captain in the army today. And um, I just remember her being her as a young girl. And she was the leader on the playground, but not bossy, like not dictating or demanding she just kind of got everybody together and they were gonna do whatever she wanted to do and but in an inspiring type of way and that was always a comment that her teachers would would talk about so today it's very fitting to see what you know that that was kind of some of that was in her character that get, oh, yeah. helped get her to where she is today it's pretty phenomenal yeah is yeah so you you have a movement um Let's go away from Army Ranger School a little bit, but it's tied to it. Um, you have a movement about delete the adjective. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, I listened to one of your speeches online uh, that you, where you talked about that. It's, it's very inspiring. And I don't think this is a political statement in any way, but that, that is still happening. And you can explain it and what you mean by it. Uh, it's still happening today, right? We, are, we as a people... We always put, we have, when there's a first, we start right. it with it, right? Yes. Just even with the four-star general, the new Joint Chiefs of Staff that was just announced. And yes. it's, it's, it's the adjective starts first. Yes. We have this tendency to always do that. And what say you about such things? You know, it's funny, the visceral reaction that I get from people when I say delete the adjective. Um, I'm not asking people to stop celebrating firsts. Yeah. It's great what you accomplished. And by saying you were a first in something or you were even in the early portions of a movement, it is a roundabout way of saying, hey, you had to overcome a few, a few different obstacles than let's say my male counterparts at Ranger yeah. School or you know, being, being a female working in the engineer field. It's not a highly it's not highly saturated with women. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely love showing up to some of these construction sites because I, my daughter, I love how you brought up your daughter. My daughter is eight years old. And she looked at me last year and said, hey mom, you know, you can be a tomboy without dressing like one. Mm -hmm. So I made a conscious effort to dress a little more feminine because I think I was trying to um, portray this image, but I don't need to portray the image of being tough. I just need to be who I am. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was actually doing the opposite of what delete the adjective is meant to be. I want you to look at me and you can see whatever you see, but when you hire me or fire me or choose to work with me or give me opportunities, it needs to be based on my competencies and what are my capabilities and, you know, are, am I willing to compromise my values? All these different things about who I am as a person is what needs to matter. Mm -hmm. That being said, I don't want to, I want to delete the adjective when it comes to um, opportunity. But I do want to recognize differences. Mm -hmm. But I want that to be the afterthought. And, and it is hard for some people because a lot of people are defined by their adjective. 
um, if I said Army Ranger School graduate, I wouldn't be talking to you. That's not an interesting story. So part of the definition of me is being a female Ranger School graduate. Mm -hmm. But I don't want I don't want that to get me anywhere. It's it's great that it gives me a voice, but I don't want you to respect or not respect my opinion because of that adjective. And it's really hard to get that message across in today's society because we're so willing to put people in a bucket. We just, we need to. And, and the buckets are what, are what hurts us. And it, I don't think it should be a political issue. So I'm gonna say it's not a political issue. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have those adjectives as, as buckets to, they can draw us together. You know, yeah. I, I want to be with fit people. I really love fitness. So every morning I spend the first hour of my day with a bunch of people who all want to work out together. It's okay to be around fit people. It's okay to be around people who are like you, as long as that doesn't drive all of your behavior. So delete the adjective is... I really want to be, uh, I want to be looked at for what I bring to the table, not what I look like when I'm walking to the table. Yeah. Yeah, that's a phenomenal message. Uh, I hope people and our listeners, I hope you're really paying attention to that. I really do. Uh, because it's, it's something for all of us to strive for and to, to truly have the mindset of recognizing people for that, for what they bring to the table. Uh, and, that's, and that's that that type of thing is very powerful. It sounds so simple. Uh, it's not so simple for people to actually behave in such a way. Uh, but items like, you know, recognizing things like that uh, can eliminate discrimination in the workplace. It can, it can, it's so powerful. It can do so many things. Uh, if you can just see through the lens of someone's capabilities and abilities versus um, any of the, of what you think or appearance or gender, whatever, um, that's coming into your mind. Don't let that stuff impact how you see that person's uh, abilities and how they fit in your organization or in your life. And Bo, I think sometimes we do it to ourselves too, where yeah. I'll say, well, you know, I am the odd man out. Look at me. I'm the only female at the site or, Ooh, I'm older than everyone around me. Maybe I shouldn't be here. And, mm -hmm. and so just as much as I want people to stop looking at me that way, I grab quite a few, it's usually younger people and say, stop putting yourself in that bucket. Stop using that as an excuse of why you can't do something. Yeah, no, that's great. Good stuff. Yeah. What say you, Luke? I, I just love that all this is coming about like when you're not a 22 year old, right? <laughs> right. Like, if anybody's listening to this podcast, we're all about like personal and professional development. So Chances are, if they're gaining value from this, then they didn't do all this stuff when they were 22 years old anyway. So I think it's awesome for them to hear from you. Lord knows I didn't, right? Like, I feel like I'm just now starting to hit my stride in life and I'm in my late thirties. So it's really cool to hear that you went and did this. And, you know, for our listeners out there, you know, sometimes you just hit your stride at that age and it just starts to happen. Right. I mean, I've read so many stories about people that were like some of the most famous actors that didn't even start acting until they were like in their late fifties. It's absolutely insane. You know? Yeah. 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 Not dead yet. Right. Yeah, that, that's right. And it's the, you know, we've had several people on the show uh, that are late, you know, I, I'm not going to say they're old because um, age is just a number <laughs> and how you behave. Um, but there have, you know, multiple chapters of life. And what's cool is they're still going after it. Their dreams haven't stopped. They didn't, they didn't give up. You know, they're doing something different today than they did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but still with the same amount of fervor and passion right. uh, and their, for their own, you know, to, to, to go after their own dreams, which I think is, is, is probably like one of the most critical things that Luke and I are trying to bring to our audience is that, mm -hmm. you know, it, like you said, it's not over till it's over. So right. just keep at it, you know? Oh, definitely. That's right. Oh, yeah. I was just looking this up right now, and it looks like, like, here's a good story. Martha Stewart uh, owned a catering firm and worked on Wall Street until she was 41 and then published her first book called Entertaining, and then her career blossomed after that. 
He was just stories. Is there a chance like, I might be able to cook someday? What's that? So there's a chance I might be a good cook someday? hundred yeah, percent. It's possible. That's, <laughs> yeah. Anything, anything is possible. A hundred percent. How about this? Ray Kroc was over 50 years old before he started McDonald's. Wow. Yeah. That's nuts, right? Sam yeah. Walton started Walmart when he was 44 years old. Yep. That's great. Julia Child didn't start her cooking career in television until she was 51. See, Lisa, you could have waited a little longer to go to ranger school and, and still <laughs> yeah, gotten yeah. through it. At some point in time, the body is saying, huh, you're, you're definitely 42. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so you like fitness. So that, that's a big thing uh, because it, to get through something like ranger school, use that as an example, uh, you have to be – you have to be physically fit because it's very physically challenging. But then it's kind of like when you run a marathon and you're at mile 18, 19, it goes from physical to mental. So you got to okay. be mentally strong. It's the physical and mental toughness to get through such a thing that you could experience in ranger school. You can experience it in multiple types of things uh, in life. So tell our listeners, like, how, how did that impact you? Because you, had, you obviously had to take some time to prep before you, even after your husband and the Sergeant Major convinced you that you needed to do this, there, you had to prep. I mean, you had to, how did that go? You had to prep physically, you had to prep mentally. And then, then did you actually feel prepared? Where were you um, just in your own mind? Like, well, I'm not, I'm not the worst. I'm not the best. I'm in the middle or, or what? How, once you got there, how, how did, how did all that go? So for the first group of women, we had, three months warning, May. Wow. So when you talk about physical fitness, 12 to 16 weeks is, is nothing. Um, you're not oh. going to be able to back squat a bunch or, or run. The, the PT test standard is five miles under 40 minutes. So that's an eight minute mile, but it's not a flat eight minute mile. And it's, um, it's a lot of eight minute miles back to back, which again, yeah. You know, for people who are runners, that's easy, but you also have to be able to do pull-ups and walk through the mountains with a rucksack on your back and, and swim with a weapon and your uniform on. So there's a strength aspect to it too. Mm -hmm. So you have to be a balanced athlete. So we had to put our names in, I believe it was the end of September in 2014. And I showed up the second, I think it was January 16th of mm -hmm. 2015 for the pre ranger course. So I had to be ready between September 30th and January 16th was the only time I had. And most of that time was, okay, you are 37 years old. Don't break yourself. Yeah, because I can imagine. A, a lot of what I wanted to do was, ooh, I want to test. Can I do the 12 mile road march fast enough? Can I do, but every time you do that, you have to recover and you break your body down. And at 42 or at 37, like it or not, Recovery does take a minute longer than it does when you're 22 years old and full of youth and mm -hmm. whatever else comes with youth. Um, but, you know, a lot of my preparation was as a major in the United States Army Reserve, I was no longer active duty, so I wasn't doing the Army stuff every day. So I didn't even own four uniforms. You had to show up with four <laughs> uniforms. I didn't even yeah. own four. Um, I didn't have magazines. I didn't have a compass. I didn't have a place where I could go check those out of the arms room and go to the school. Yeah. I, I couldn't even get a, go to the doctor to get a physical because I didn't, I wasn't close to a military installation. And when you show up as a 37 year old female and say, Hey, I need a ranger school physical. The doctor says, uh, first you're a woman. Yeah. And second, um, this is for the this is for the younger people. I mean, there was an entire second set of tests I had to get run because I was over the age of 35. So a lot of my preparation was, holy cow, I haven't done small unit tactics in 10 years. So I need to go read the manuals of, I'm now at a more strategic type level yeah. and I don't do this tactical work anymore. So I was studying the, the squad level tactics um, I went to an emergency care facility with the, the physical forms printed out because, like mm -hmm. I said, I couldn't, I couldn't get a ranger school physical uh, anywhere, and I couldn't get paperwork to allow it to happen. I couldn't get the Army Reserve System to figure out a way to pay for it, 
and I had such a short timeline that, and I didn't want to risk it. You know, if I'm going to, I'm going to shave my head and choose to go to the school and leave my job and leave my kids and leave my husband, I'm not going to let something stupid like I didn't have the right uh, EKG keep me out of the school. So I went to an emergency care facility with the Ranger School physical forms and a blank check and mm-hmm. said, I'm not leaving until we figure this out. And I spent four or five hours uh, the week of Christmas at an emergency care facility trying to get all the paperwork done just so I could go to the school. So yeah, a lot wow. of my work was, things, was, was not physical. And, uh-huh. But I think all of that fed into the mental aspect of it. So you talked about the physical and mental toughness required for any long endurance challenging event. And you know, knowing that I had to work just to get there made it all that sweeter every time I got to stay. Mm-hmm. When I didn't fail, when I didn't quit, when I wanted to quit, but then I woke up the next day and I was still there, the mere fact that I had fought so hard to walk through those gates that, that it, was, it was exciting. I actually have, he's a captain now, but there was a young lieutenant that went through with me from the Mexican army and he mm-hmm. sends me random Facebook messages every once in a while and he just calls me smile. Because we would be marching through the woods and I'd be smiling and he'd say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> we slept for 45 minutes last night. What's wrong with you? And it really was. It was an honest yeah. question. What's wrong with you? And the only thing I could say to him is, I get to be here. And, you know, fighting to get somewhere makes you appreciate it so much more. It's, yeah. you know, the difference between... God bless you if your parents can pay for your college tuition, but tell me that that kid who doesn't work three jobs leading up to college and then works all through college and then takes a couple years afterwards, that person really appreciates what went into getting that degree. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that person isn't going to skip a class and that person's going to have a different look um, to their resiliency when it comes to that hard work and that labor. Yeah. I would agree with that completely. So what has, what, what has, what did uh, that accomplishment aside from, aside from, from the accomplishment itself and the publicity around it and the opportunity to tell your story, uh, what has it done for you in your civilian work uh, in your leadership abilities in your company? Uh, Do you have a different leadership perspective? Do you treat, your subordinates who follow you, who you're in charge of differently, or even now being in battalion command, right? Do you, do you see a vast difference in how you lead and how you see other people and encourage people? What did you take from that experience um, yeah. that, you, that, you, uh, that is now part of who you are as a leader? So I definitely want to say it's not, it's not a leadership training course. It's Mm -hmm. definitely a leadership testing force. Um, And what I got to see is I got to see how other people fail. Everybody there fails. You fail in how you're tested. You fail physically. You start falling apart. You fail mentally. Almost everybody, whether or not they'll admit to it, has a breakdown at some point in time. 10 days, a couple hours of sleep a night at best, at average, no showers in the field, carrying everything you own on your back. At some point in time, you really just want to curl up in a ball and cry. Everybody does it. It was good for me to see, first of all, we're all still human. Second of all, um, I've always thought, hey, I need to talk to people the way they need to hear me and not necessarily the way I want to present myself. But that was even more true because I didn't have direct leadership. Nobody had to listen to me. So where in the time command or company command, I say something and say, you must, and people say, Roger, ma'am. Mm-hmm. But out there, there was, no, there was no blind, I'm going to listen to you because of your position of authority. Right. So I had to be creative and I had to connect with people who were 15 years my junior. One of the guys, we were, um, we were partnered up together and I came to the realization that my duffel bag had been in the army longer and this guy had been alive. <laughs> so I was issued my duffel bag before this, my peer was born. So yeah. the things I would say to a 
fellow Gen Xer didn't hit home with a millennial or even younger. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how that works. Yeah. Um, so, so that was something is I really had to learn how to speak to a different group of people um, using a different type of authority. I also, um, I had to find ways to connect with them that was different. The songs that got stuck in my head was not the same songs that were getting stuck in their head. Uh, but I think one of the best things that I realized that I've been able to incorporate in my leadership style is there are not that many differences between men and women. And I say that because in corporate America, you often hear about women um, leave the workforce early because they want to take care of kids or they do, they make decisions based on their family, which does happen, but it's because that's what we expect of them. It's not necessarily the way men and women want to behave. Mm -hmm. I say that to say this, men love their kids. So I, I'll tell it, I'll, I'll use an example. I'll use a story. I had a coworker, he had three kids, I have two kids. Um, my boss very easily said, hey, you need to go on a business trip to my male coworker. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, that's, that's my territory, that's my work, that I need to do that. Um, yeah, but you have kids, was, was my boss's response. And my response was, well, he has three, I have two, so therefore I should go and he should stay with his kids. Oh, but his wife stays home. Okay, well, my husband works from home right now. Um, so he can watch the kids. And when he doesn't mm -hmm. work from home, we have, we have family. I mean, our, we're completely competent. And it was yeah. one of those things that just we automatically assume that, that women care for their kids more than men. But being in the field, a lot with these guys who are, the barriers are breaking down. There's no mm -hmm. so, social norms when you're out there and you haven't showered in a few days <laughs> and the amount of guys who were pulling out pictures of their kids were looking at ultrasounds I and mean, yeah. the, the ones that were getting sad and getting lonely and it's it's not that masculinity is a facade it's that we don't allow men to choose so uh if i'm a stay-at-home mom i'm amazing i sacrifice my career for my children if I'm a working mom, you're amazing. You're sacrificing for your family. If you stay home and decide to be a stay-at-home dad, you're weak and don't provide for your family. If you work but you don't make enough money, why aren't you working on it? Yeah. You don't have the same opportunities as women. And if you can look at that side of the coin, um, it changes everything with regards sure. to yourself. And so, therefore, I think that probably changed my leadership style more than anything, was realizing that, men love their children yeah that's powerful that's very powerful i hope a lot of people are listening uh because <laughs> that that happens even in my experience uh in corporate america versus the military that's that's a subconscious bias that just comes out naturally in folks and they don't even they don't even know they're doing it but they do it yeah. and, and there's all the time right yeah and i and i will say too that was a perfect statement it made me reflect uh, talking about Ranger School as a leadership test. It's not a leadership course or development course. It's a test. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember it, it took me right back to Warrant Officer Candidate School. And back in, when I went through years ago, I don't even know if they still do it today. They had high school to flight school programs okay. uh, where, where they bring uh, literally 18 year old, 18 year olds, they'd send them to boot camp and then from boot camp to the uh, warrant officer candidate school and then to flight school. But when, oh, wow. they're in the, but when they're in the candidate school, they're with mostly seasoned non-commissioned officers who are then becoming warrant officers, right? And right. It's, it's the same thing. It's a test. It's not a development school. It, you're being yeah. tested. And I yeah. tell you, Lisa, I think we had like nine of them in my course. Not one of them made it. Oh, really? Now, they didn't kick them out. They, re, they recycled, but all nine of them within like the first two weeks because they had, I, I thought, man, this, they're really at a disadvantage in this course. And it's not because they're not capable or they're not, may not be great soldiers or great pilots someday. Right. But in that setting, they're being, they had no leadership background. They had nothing to, to stand on. Right. And, and you're being tested and there's no time to try and mentor them and develop them because, <laughs> because you're being tested. It's, but yeah, that's a great point. 
It's a test. And that's what civilian American doesn't get either, right? You don't really have those opportunities to be tested because it's always, everything is real life right now. Um, yes. You're being tested every day, really. Uh, so great, great, great analogy. I love it. My mind is stuck on like how warped our other men's minds that they think men are weak just for staying at home. Like to me, that's the smartest guy in the room. I actually, <laughs> I reached out to a guy <clears throat> about coming to work for a company I used to work for. We used to work together at career builder it's in Chicago. And we always thought his girlfriend at the time when I worked with him was like made up because she was always busy. Like she was, I think going to medical school or something like that. Yeah, She was definitely going to medical school. So we were like, you know, we've never met her. I think she's made up. So like a decade <laughs> later, I reach out to him. I'm like, Hey, we have this position and I think you'd be perfect for it. And he said, you know, Luke, sorry, but, uh, you know, my wife finished medical school. She's a really successful surgeon. And now I just stay home with the kids. So I'm really not interested. And I thought to myself, I said, man, that was truly the smartest guy in the room. He just hit the holy grail. Like they need to get that out of their minds. I have no problem with that. I think that is, you know, what gender role should just be, you know, evacuated from our minds. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep, for sure. Yeah, I have sure. no problem with that. I would gladly stay at home with the kids. Depends on the kids. Yeah, and podcast with Bo all day. It'd be great. <laughs> That's right. Just be on the mic all day. <laughs> That's right. It'd be awesome. Yeah. Awesome, man. So, so do you still, uh, are you doing a lot of speaking these days? Um, are you still out there on that type of circuit? Uh, how's that going for you? I do try. Uh, obviously, with the current pandemic, most of the sure. conferences that I go to have been canceled. Um, but I do try to reach out. Um, I try to reach out in various ways, things like this. Uh, and it, anytime I can speak to large groups, I try to. I just this morning reached out to a local army recruiter to see I want to get more involved in the high schools and the college mm -hmm. ROTC programs. Nice. I don't have anything really bright to say. But I think I'm willing to say the things that other people are thinking. And, yeah. and because I've been given a voice or an opportunity to do that, I feel like being silent is, would be a disservice. So one of the things I've always loved about the military is that teach, coach, mentor, and mm -hmm. that mentality. And I want it to carry over both into my military life as I'm still a uniformed service member but also in my civilian life. And I want that to be outside just my office and with the people I work with. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want to poke people in the ribs and, and make them think. And I get made fun of because on Facebook, I have a, a good friend of mine uh, who lives in Australia and he actually recently reached out to me because I have no idea if you're a Democrat or Republican. And I said, perfect. Because I post stuff because I want people to talk, but you have yeah. to be just controversial enough that people uh -huh. want to comment, but not so controversial that it's a you're an idiot. And I had, yeah. I had a speaking opportunity uh, and it probably was one of my favorite speaking opportunities, but it was for a real estate lobbying organization. And they weren't Democrats, they weren't Republicans, they weren't libertarians, they weren't political, they weren't politicized, but they had a political agenda and that was for real estate agents. And it was fun for me to sit in that room as a speaker. A lot of my speeches, I think I could probably get more out of it than the people who are listening to me. Yeah. But what I got out of that was there was a whole room of people who completely disagreed with each other on every issue out there. Wow. Trump, Hillary, I don't care who you support, but they agreed on one issue. They just didn't agree how to get to them, get yeah. to the end state. But fundamentally, they agreed on where they wanted to go. They just couldn't figure out the path together. They couldn't agree upon the path. And that was really eye-opening for me. And, and that's another reason why I love doing speeches is I can, bring, I can bring other people's viewpoints into the room. I can say, hey, I don't feel bad about being a woman. I think that maybe sometimes we're a little hard on our men. And... That's something shocking for most people to hear, especially from somebody like me, who I am a feminist. I'm just mm -hmm. a really weird feminist. 
that's, that's yeah, that's good. <laughs> I could, yeah, that's amazing. That's good stuff. Yeah, I think you're right. That's all you, you, you're definitely on point. So anybody listening, you can create there. You just got the, you just got the instructions of a lifetime. Be just <laughs> controversial enough to spark the conversation, but not push people away from you and, and not get the other side. Right. Yes. I think, I think more, well, if we had a political show, that's what we would talk about. How yes. to, how to, <laughs> how to, how to bridge the divide that is so rampant. Yes. Yeah, would, for sure. We would just upset people though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I long for the day where you can have civil discourse about all the issues without people yelling at each other or, or being, you know, just totally one side or the other and not listening. Uh, you can have your views, you can have that and, and everybody does and everybody should have their beliefs and their values. Uh, wow. And not the same for everybody. Uh, but you should be able to sit down with individuals who don't have the same views and, and try to understand, you know, what it is they think or how they think, because only then will you get to the best solutions for yeah. uh, on, on the other side. Yeah, I, I remember we went through a stage where everybody said, don't ever talk about politics, religion. And I don't remember what the other one was, but don't ever talk about these in public forums. And I recently posted that I thought we, we did a huge disservice to our nation because instead of talking about those, or instead of not talking about them, we should have taught each other to speak about them civilly. Civilly, yeah. is that a word? Yeah, civilly, I get it. Sure, yeah. <laughs> With, you yeah, I, get it. I understand. Ooh. We'll Come agree, on. it's a word. I yeah. knife in the drawer. Definitely, <laughs> we'll see. yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> yes. Civil discussions. There we go. Civil That's discussions. Right. <laughs> yeah, people ask me um, questions all the time, having been in two different administrations at the White House, vastly different, Bush and Obama. They're completely different administrations, but there's this, there's this machine, and this is how I explain it. It's like, yeah, I get it. Everybody sees what they see on TV, and there's lots of propaganda. But behind the scenes, probably 90% of the individuals working and supporting the White House, the presidency, they're, they're career government employees, they're military members under the White House military office, and it's just right. a machine to make that run and operate. And you cannot come into that every day with any type of political chips on your shoulder because yeah. you will not fit, you'll be gone, you'll be out, goodbye, right? It won't, it won't work. You can't accomplish the mission, you can't get it done. You have to, you have to work together. Everybody's got to be focused. Oh, what an interesting insight you must have. I'd love to pick your brain on that. Yeah, I, I share it whenever I can. So I like to do speaking as well. And um, yeah, I'm all about it. It's, we can bridge the gap. I know we can. There's, there's ways to do it for sure. So anyway, we won't keep you. We, we could keep you. Uh, we like, Luke and I like to talk. So we do. We, we keep you all day. So whenever we, whenever we end a podcast, uh, our guest has to end the show. So you can close us out with whatever you want to say, whatever message you want to deliver to the audience, but then at the very end, say that's a wrap. Yeah, so I do have a Facebook site and it's um, hashtag delete the adjective. I'm also on Instagram, Lisa A. Jasper. Uh, my, my biggest goal is, you know, I've had lots of goals over the last few years and it's not, it's no longer just gender integration with where our world is today. I want to start more conversations and they can be, great conversations. They can be horrible conversations. I just want them to be productive conversations. Uh, so delete the adjective is, should be a forum where people can either reach out to me individually or reach out to others to start those discussions. And, and I look forward to continuing to use my voice to try to keep people open, honest, and headed towards the right direction, which is civil discussion. And that's a wrap. Oh, 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 oh,